Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to welcome to the live stream. Uh, before we have uh, the captain on, we'll be talking about uh, economy today, and it's very um, like we talked about last last Sunday with uh, Hinu about the arts and finances and funding available to artists, uh, the creative blood, the soul feeders of our um, of our nation, of our uh, you know of our our people and um and it's like um arts has a real you know a real tie into spirituality and stuff and often you know uh, we'll see a lot of great art come out of great stress and difficult times and uh what i found during this time and dif of difficulty is um it was the crazy ultra rich people trying to um, show everyone that they you know that they they have they're like everybody else they're like this the people that are unemployed that the people that are going to be suffering majorly the low income earners the solo parents uh you know uh, people who've never who've never been unemployed in their lives before who are suddenly going to be coming um who are suddenly going to be appearing um on the doll queues and waiting at wins and work and income and uh for the first time in their life they've never experienced any of that um they've always had you know have, I, I won't say they've had it easy but they've always you know come straight out of some sort of uh, situation and straight into work and up and up and up and needed to go into some sort of uh, you know place where they needed help and i just wanted to play this thing before we um we start before i bring on and just uh, it's very interesting because I just saw this and I thought, wow, this is interesting, because it, it kind of um, it kind of um, does help some people just are not like, especially the ultra rich are just not understanding what it's going to be like for those people who aren't special, um, you know, access to. Um, you know, millions in the bank account. I'm Jackson, and I'm not. These people, at time of crisis, they provided the strength that we all need to get through. So it's time for us normal people to say thank you. I see a number of deaths every day, and the constant threat of being infected by my family is terrifying. But the one thing that gives me strength to get to my job every day is watching Ellen broadcast from her mansion. This is, well, this is like being in jail, is what it is. You're waiting on hold for some length of the days now. Um, I've lost my job, I've got my money, I've lost everything. Um, but this video of a mega killer, they're surrounded in massive kitchens. Really I've been working 48 hours straight and my face hurts from wearing a mask for so long. I was going to go lick a to end it all, but my name from Master Chef reminded me why I'm here. I just had to break up a fight in aisle three, and every day people call me a fing cunt. But having Sam Armitage reassure me from her sprawling rural property really makes it all worthwhile. The landlord refuses to. Uh... You know, give me the increase in rent, so uh, I am on the street. And, uh, you know, this bloke on the, on the beach, man, he makes me feel better. I don't know who he is, but, you know, I, I knew him. I'm not But, look, it's Alfred coming away. We really are all in this together. Thanks, celebrities. Thank you, celebrities. So celebrities from the bottom of our pathetic little nobody unfamous worthless dog broke our hearts you are the truth hi i'm Greg. Before we are back, all right. So 
that's been keeping me, uh, uh, stuff like that's been keeping me, um, what shall I say? Um, keeping. What is that noise in the background there, Jared? It's happening my attention. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's We're like live this. on that now. You know, you need, you know, you need the right tool. There's something it. else. It's, it's like a lot of. Ah, uh, I've got my multicolored pen here. Ah, right, okay. You've got new technology. That's great. You've got some, some other sort of noise in the background there. Okay, let me uh, try this. Uh, How's that? Is that better? No, it's still a bit... Um, it's like a rustling sound. Hmm. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us. We're about to get, get, get on the go here. You want to log out and log back in. It's something to do with your audio. I've yeah. noticed that happening a lot on, on the internet today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, uh, read it and then come back in too. All right. This is, um, for me, this, one, this, um, this stream is quite important. It's just as important as the one I did with uh, Henry last week. So, in the sense, because I, with, I think the last count I heard was 30,000 people have become unemployed in New Zealand in the last uh, few weeks since we've been in lockdown. And it's very serious. That is going to be huge stress on our social uh, development, on our economy going forward. And that's just the tip of the iceberg as far as, I, as, far as I, I'm concerned, as far as I understand business. An economy and how the the downfall of that um, mountain comes down is that that all these other things that will come into um, into effect and all these other issues that will come um, you know uh, will like homes uh, tuition fees uh, petrol uh, food um, clothing all these things uh, school fees uh, all these things are going to be affected by what's happening at the moment as we come out of this. And um, and I really wanted to sit down with um, Jared and discuss this because he's someone who, uh, when it comes to money, is very smart and as uh, with his background uh, and his career, he understands these things far better than I do. Um, you know, and it's um, it's good to know someone uh, like him, as well as good to know someone like Henu, uh, who's in the arts and in, in our community, but also to know someone who's um, you know who's able to advise about finance and how to look after budgeting and stuff like that, and what's best for um, for us going forward after this, um, as we come out of it. I know a lot of um, a lot of small businesses are going to hugely suffer. I know a lot of um, you know, um, people are going to find it really hard uh, dealing with uh, budgeting, especially as they uh, as they realize they have le a lot less to spend. But that lot less to spend is also going to affect uh, what is being actually spent over the counter and how that affects person people behind the counter and such. Uh, let me see if I if I'm able to get um Jared back on here without any background noise. Okay, is that better? That's perfect. So I wasn't sure Yay. what that was. Welcome back. All right, um, Jared, introduce yourself because I'm I'm sure that a lot of people don't know who you are, even you know, seeing you around the community and stuff in the art scene. But yeah, please. So probably the first thing I should say is um, I'm definitely not uh, a financial advisor in the strict sense of the term. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe you could call me a, uh, a financial analyst, but actually m more my my kind of go-to kind of thing in, in that professional aspect is really around risk management. So it's really around how do, how do we better manage the risk of things going wrong from small things to, to big things like pandemics um, and how do we carry on 
the, the things that we need to do um, um, despite the things that can go wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, also I spent a lot of time um, in and around the arts um, and uh, to take, you know, take, take, a, take a lot of time to understand kind of, I suppose, the cultural things that are going on. And uh, I think for a long time, I, I kind of saw the two things as being, you know, very disparate. Mm. Uh, but actually, there, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of connection with them, and probably um, right now, um, you know, we're seeing lots of creativity happening. We're mm. seeing lots of innovation. Um, we're seeing all of the creative ways in which people deal with when things go wrong. Mm. Uh, and um, certainly, you know, we can talk about final matters, uh, but also, you know, we can talk about them through the lens of creativity and innovation. Uh, and, um, yeah, looking forward to having a chat. All right. So I was listening to um, a quick video uh, that the Herald put out online yesterday about the amount of people that are going to be un that are already unemployed due to this pandemic uh, and do due mostly to the lockdown. Um, you know, and uh, they've assessed, I mean, the last count that I had was at 30,000 new unemployed. Now, for someone who's who's had to, you know, rely on, on the benefit from time to time over the years, um, you know, or even uh, give up a portion of my secondary income because, you know, you had to uh, pay the double tax because you're working two jobs. Um, I'm... I think a lot of people are going to be shocked by go, by having to go in that queue, you know, this week when they go up to that queue and they realize that all the and, and this is going to be really an eye opener for people who have never been there, uh, people who have never had to go through that door and feel like a total moron, a total the humiliation that comes with saying, I need this. I have not been able to do it on my own. Now I need this, and and it is a humiliating thing. But it's 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 a it's a time to actually take your head off and go, hey, yes, we you know we are actually in this together. Not like the celebrities, not like those idiots who you know in their mansions go, yeah, we're all in this together, dancing around. But we are in this together because finally we get a portion of our uh, of our people. Uh, of our citizens who have never seen what it's like to be at work and income, to to walk up there and have to fill out forms, and they have, and then they turn around and go, so what's in your bank account at the moment? Have you have you emptied out your bank account? Because that's the first thing they say. Like, do you have any savings, sir? And you're like, well, it's it's up in shares. Well, like you know, why don't you use that? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? whole feeling of like uh, uselessness that comes with being there I think all this like I've heard over the years like you know doll bludgers you know uh, nanny state and all this and this is when we really need this uh, and that people are going to realize this is why we really need the social welfare system in place for moments like this of course there are people who have abused the system for years uh, some for generations you know um, and you know, just relied upon it. But there are those who have really, you know, tried hard. And we're going to find that a lot of people are going to be in that situation who've worked all their lives, suddenly, from hand to mouth, paycheck to mouth, um, table, for weeks on end, for years on end, now don't uh, don't have the access to that fund anymore. What do you think? You know. How do you think they're going to deal with this? Because it's a really strange position to be for uh, 30,000 people. So um, probably two things. And I like, I like the, the analogy, analogy of the boat, and I heard a really, heard good, a really good version of it the other day, day which was... Which was we, we, like, the ship, the ship is sinking. Right, we've abandoned ship. Let, let's use that kind of idea. So we've abandoned ship. Yep. And we're on the lifeboats, right? 
but we are not all in the same lifeboat. Yeah. Right? There's different lifeboats, and some of those lifeboats, for different reasons, are stocked differently. Um, they may have departed from the sinking ship, um, you know, on the left side or the front side, the back or the front. And, um, you might be experiencing different conditions. They might you, you might be in a boat with different people from another lifeboat. So we're, we're definitely not all in the same lifeboat. So I think this analogy of saying, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat really does not talk to the reality of the situation. Yeah. The second thing is that there, there's a historical context to this, which is that, you know, we had a global financial crisis back in 2008. Yeah. And we never recovered from it. Mm. The, the, the world did not recover from it. You know, up until um, even, you know, within the last six months before uh, the pandemic um, became apparent, now various governments around the world were still engaging in exercises to try and save their respective country economy. Um, you know, like Australia and New Zealand, just as an example, um, have got, I think, the lowest interest rates that we've mm. ever had, right? Now, the, the reason why we're at such low interest rates is because um, uh, the, the, the raising and, and lowering of, of interest rates, uh, that, so, you know, if your interest rates are way too high, mm. that shows that your economy is in real trouble. If your interest rates are too low or very, very low, that shows that you're also in deep, deep problems. Mm. And so the very fact that our interest rates were so low was not because the economy was great. It was an indication that uh, we had basically run out of ammunition to, mm. uh, to, to, to get the economy working in the way that, you know, um, was expected. So... We were not, even before um, this pandemic, there's a great range of people who um, consistently talked about the fact that uh, we had not recovered from that original global financial crisis in 2008. Mm. Uh, we were still, different countries were still trying to um, keep their economies working. Um, and so we've entered into the pandemic in, you could almost say, in the worst possible financial shape. The, yeah. the, the world has entered the pandemic in the worst possible financial shape. So if anyone is out there and going, like, I, I'm in a really terrible financial position right now, it's like, well, yes, and the whole globe was. Now, sure, there are some people who... Um, uh, have been doing very, very well. But for the most part, most mm. of us have been really doing it tough in different ways. And um, and now the pandemic has come. Uh, and now we're getting to learn a lot more about the troubles um, and the real concerns that, um, you know, there were, you know, it, it, the global financial system was going to topple over anyway. Um, the pandemic yeah. was just kind of the catalyst for it. Yeah, it's you're right. I mean, like we, I mean, Greece never recovered, did they? I mean, seriously, Italy, that kind no. of yeah. Um, Italy was no. so Europe was trying to recover, and a lot of it wasn't. And here they are now in serious, serious crisis mode with so many deaths, with so many cases, overwhelming their. Um, their health system, their economy, and in a, I mean, in a sense, we're kind of, you know, in a in a in a, in a better boat, you know, um, compared to those you know those countries. Do you see? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm optimistic about how we come out of this, but um, how do you see for us as Kiwis and Australians, uh, you know, being very close econ economically? How do you think we would? 
come out of this compared to the other countries. You know, there's lots of different ways to measure these things, but let's just, you know, look at a couple of things. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have been experiencing one of the worst property bubbles yeah. um, in a century. Uh, and that's and that's not just, you know, by New Zealand or Australian standards. That's by global standards, you know, like Sydney and Australia and other major capital cities in Australia have got some of the highest property prices in the world but at various stages and possibly even just before the pandemic, you know, um, mm. Sydney was up there in the top 10. Um, Auckland property prices, just in, in insanity. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of different factors around how that occurred. Uh, but, you know, those those prices were not sustainable. Mm. Mm. Now, one of the big problems that Australia and New Zealand is going to face is um, the potential, uh, and, you know, like, the, you know, we're not talking about anything new here. Um, uh, both the Reserve Bank in Australia and um, simil the, the, the similar um, uh, Reserve Bank in New Zealand have always had a mind towards the threat of a collapse in property prices and what it might do to the banking system. Mm. So both governments would be very, very on top of that that risk. So a lot of the government stimulus in New Zealand even is 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 going to have a tilt towards how to make sure that the the system does doesn't topple over completely you know mm. um because and and, and and it is like a bit of a deck of cards so yep. you know if you can't pay your rent that might mean that the um owner of that property might not be able to pay their mortgage right um, uh, now if you start getting large numbers of people not able to pay their mortgage you know the banks are only going to be able to sustain that for so long the the other potential risk is that uh, people start panic selling and saying, well, we can't afford our mortgage, so let's sell our house now. Maybe they've got some equi equity in it. Yeah. Um, and so you could actually end up with a disruption in, in, the, in the property market. On the plus side, um, th this could actually lead to much lower rentals, potentially. Yeah. Um, but then the flip side of that is that, well, you know, no, no amount of um, cheap interest rates, no amount of cheap rent is going to help you if you don't actually have any money to actually pay either a mortgage or rent. You know, we know that New Zealand and Australia also had very, very high um, levels of problems with housing, you know. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you just need to look at it, any, um, you know, recent kind of report from the sorts of organisations, for example, the Salvation Army, that, you know, often do reports about um, the state of homelessness, the state of yeah. um, the housing crisis, and 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 on all of those dimensions, we we were we were in a crisis before the pandemic, and yeah. and so I just want to make this point that if if anyone kind of feels like this is a terrible situation and they you know are feeling really lost and feeling you know really down and depressed about this, it's like this is not your fault, right? Yeah. This this this, this is a system that we have found ourselves in that was very much unfair and, and was very much in trouble before this this pandemic happened. Well, I mean, I, I mean I've been, been, I moved out of home when I was about 17. So I, I moved into Auckland. This is like around about 80, 88, 89. Around about, um, about 93, the area I used to live in, which was Penmuir, got gentrified. So because... Uh, it, it it was a there was a there was a street that went through from um, from Pekaranga, Howick, the very very high end multi million dollar Ch Asian investment Chinese investment straight and then it was into like be instead of going to Mount Wellington Highway into town and into the motorway you could go up down Tripoli Road and straight onto Mission Bay, 
So mm. what they decided was we're going to buy up all these houses on either side of those roads. So and so you got Glen Innes, which is a uh, Glen Dowie, Glen Innes, and uh, Pen Muir area there. They all got bought up. Basically, you got three hundred thousand. If you had a, if you had a rundown house, you got three hundred fifty thousand dollars just like that. So everybody who owned a home sold up. Now, then those homes got done were left just like that because it was on the main road. They got sold off for about five hundred thousand because it was on that road. And suddenly, all this, all these, like uh, you would get, like, um, what's our version of Whole Foods in New Zealand, right? So you'd get that in Glen Innes, and in mm. you'd get a Whole Foods in Glen Innes, where you have uh, Pacific Islanders, low-income um, uh, Maoris, low-income Pakia uh, families, right, and Indian families, suddenly are being put out of there because. They can't afford the homes. They thought they'll take the money up front, right? Then they realize that now, well, wait, we can't afford five. It would look good, 300000 in our hands, but do we actually buy a house now? It's 500000 And so I saw that happening in the 90s. So we're looking back about 30 years. So this whole, um, this whole idea of uh, putting all our finances onto the whole housing system and watching it uh, become... So become so out of reach for the for the average family, right? So, you know, the young young newly married, double working income, you know, not even being able to afford homes. And um, often, you know, the older people go, well, you know, it's not too hard to own a home, and they don't they don't they don't understand how the money, the equity, and how hard it is to actually buy into that when you have somebody who can basically come in and go, yeah, I'll take that for five hundred thousand. And you're like, uh, um, we're budgeting for 250. And so that's where we've become. And so most of our houses that we know in, New Z in, in Northland, in New Z especially in Whangarei, in stores, are owned by outside investors. They don't even live here. Uh, they like their, they like their uh, investment properties. And so, you know, they don't even know. They expect Amer Auckland prizes for homes, for rental properties. And so I see that a lot. And that's why, you know, we, I often walk, walk downtown once a week and count all the stores that are empty. And we go, why are they still, why are they empty? This is our city that we should, you know, we seem to be, should be, you know, making sure that we look good. That's our, uh, our inner city area, especially. Why are the inner city areas so empty? And that's because I, I feel personally that the, the prices are so high because they're asking for Auckland prices when you, and here, they just don't understand that, People don't have that sort of uh, money. And it's the same thing with rent, right? I mean, the wages are different. And so it's, a, it's like if you're saying that people can't afford the rent and the other person can't afford to pay the mortgage, then it's a downhill battle trying to get back up because you won't have your equity up in the end. And you'll be like those Indians, those Apakia, those, those um, Maoris and those um, Pacific Islanders in, in um, Glendowie going, I have nothing to, you know, what do you think about that sort of situation where you have people, uh, outside investors who have no sort of, uh, um, what, what is it, no connection to the area or the people? Well, I think this goes, uh, it, it lines up to your earlier question from an economic perspective, you know, what, what's New Zealand's fate potentially? Hmm. You know, New Zealand, like a lot of other countries, um, was better was benefiting benefiting mm. in this two way globalization. Um, you know, globalization allowed New Zealand products and services to to go out, mm. uh, and also New Zealand was then opened up to tourism, mm. uh, to investment. Um, to uh, uh, and 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 you know overseas students are a good example. Yep. Uh, you know, I remember early on. Um, I think it was even before we went into lockdown. There, there was an interesting um, discussion on Radio Nat uh, National with uh, one of the um, representatives of of universities across New Zealand. And yeah, they, they want about, to let people come back in. 
So well, they were talking yeah. about what, what what's the impact of, of foreign students because even at that stage there, there was a, a cutback on on uh, for example students from certain countries mm. and that was already having a, an impact even before the lockdown kicked in. Uh, and so what had happened is that you know universities had had basically been asked to find different ways to fund their operations without taking from the public funds. And yeah. so they had basically built themselves around, uh, in effect, foreign investment, yeah. um, foreign student fees. And so they, 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 were, they were asked, you know, like, well, that we can understand that obviously, you know, you might need to cut back on courses because of, you know, the loss of foreign students. But why is it that you can't even provide the basic services for your domestic students? Right. Well, the whole system has been built on this reliance, you know, like, you know, our tourism industry has just been decimated. Well, why has it been decimated? Well, because it relied on tourists that can't come in, you know. Yeah. Um, the logging, logging industry has been, you know, uh, devastated. Why is that? Well, because we can't, you know, either we can't send the trees or no one wants them anymore, you know. Um, Australia is going to be, um, you know, uh, you know, I think, uh, so, so let's, you know, also separate Australia from New Zealand. Yeah. I think Australia is going to face a whole bunch of woe, whole yeah. bunch of woe for lots of different reasons because, you know, Australia is a humongous economy that has got resource unimaginable you know levels of resources that they've been digging up and and shipping off outside of australia and then they import the same raw materials back but at a, at a value-added price yeah you know the 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 opportunity that new zealand has is to take a step back and go what are we going to what, what are we going to do? You know, if, if we're living on, on now an island of 4 million people that will have its borders shut off to some degree for quite some time, uh, what's the way that we might need to reorganise ourselves uh, in order to g move forward out of this pandemic? But, you know, here's the challenging bit, Right. Full marks to New Zealand, probably one of the few countries in the world that will totally pretty eradicate uh, COVID-19, at least for a right. bit. Uh, full marks. But if everybody else is in lockdown, if everybody else is being careless, um, if everybody else starts going through these waves of um, reducing their lockdown measures, the infections rising back up again, and and then, and and then you know, you know, New, New Zealand's going to have a have a really difficult, challenging time of looking at everybody else in the world and go like, who do we who do we let in? Yeah, that's my next where question. Do we from where are we doing? Yeah, so let's. Um, that leads me to immigration. So we know that we have a um, we have a host of workers. They're like in the fruit picking industry. There are. Um, that are um, tourists, students working uh, summer jobs, uh, uh, people coming on visitors, you know, visitors' visas. Uh, so there's all that jobs that are available coming into it. As we go into winter, there'll be, I guess, different fruits, different vegetables, that jobs will be open up because people won't be able to come in to do those jobs. So now there's jobs available to our own citizens. The other thing is that this will mean um, by having a closed off border, it will mean that we'll, our own employers and business owners will have to think about how they're going to actually uh, look at paying the amount of money that, that we're used to getting as citizens compared to what you, you know, under the, under the table, underhanded payments. Some of these, we're known that some of these uh, employers have done with, you know, like students and so on, because, you know, who, who doesn't want to get an extra under the t um, a couple of bucks under the table if you don't have to pay taxes, right? So what's what I feel about this is that as our borders are closing, we're now going to be able to look at things in a very navel-gazing way to help our own economy grow. 
we're not going to be worrying about what you know say what Aussie's doing what America's doing what the islands are doing but how we can help our own people get up I mean those 30,000 people who are going to be unemployed they are going to need jobs there'll be ones that will be there going well I want to still get my you know hundred thousand a year job it's like sorry sir if you want to feed your family that is not going to be possible right now you know and you're going to have to come down off that come down off the rung of that ladder a little bit or a couple more but the other thing is then all those jobs that used to be taken up by overseas students by um by tourists are now going to be opened up to our own citizens and it's going to be available to them and i think the other thing was i have you know being at uni i have you know been um, been with um overseas students uh, in the classroom and you know and they they pay a premium to get in right uh to be here and some of them uh they're able to after three years able to apply for work and so on and citizenship and so on and that is actually for me i feel in a way has actually harmed our country and you know the workforce in a sense because it meant that like it's kind of like um instead of these very highly qualified taught people by our own country which education should have been coming to us to our citizens that high level of education has been taken up by in seats by you know because they could afford to by overseas people those people instead of going back to their country and really raising the level of quality of life for the country say like doctors right so we teach doctors and then we keep those doctors say from bangladesh from india from you know wherever they stay here and they live here because there's more money here compared to what they would get in india so rather than being able to go back to india and um helping their communities get up you know be providing the health and um so on um so whatever quality of life right raising them but we're we're basically stealing them in the in the, because we want their quality their higher education rather than actually giving those high um those spots those seats at that courses at those degrees and bachelors and doctors and um uh phds to our own citizens who are trying to get in there but they can't because someone has more money to get in there because they're able to sign off the check by mom and dad right up up front whereas our own citizens have to rely on a student loan student allowance or allow mom and dad to pay you know get their money together to save up to pay that and we've seen that in australia as well where you know and even in aussie you see like students basically not able to get in citizens you know citizens been resident not able to get in because someone's able to pay the check up front uh but the other thing was we ourselves saw in about 2006 2007 with the brain drain of technology going overseas and uh we saw our people uh in the tech sector and we've got a you know in the last two years there was a huge need in new zealand for these people these people left during um the national government i think it was and everybody was panicking at that time going, talking about the brain drain from new zealand and we were just like going why aren't you keeping these people here give them more money because here we are now all these smart people were basically kids have gone overseas gone to america gone to ireland gone to uk um, gone to china gone to japan you know all those other countries where they can pay them higher rates of living than we could and the brain drain's gone but in the same way we've got we've kept their ones as well and now i feel that you like you're saying about the whole university thing because they've built it up around um exchange students and not only that see they have to live somewhere as well right so the rent the apartments the high end 500 500 dollars a week rental properties where there's five people in that stinking old unit you know and so those the, those million dollar homes are getting paid off by these students and so all this stuff and it's kind of like i feel like even though we're in this um in the situation we can really come out really well as a as a country if we start thinking about how do we help ourselves and not worry about other countries and what they're doing but how do we 
raise the level of education, put out, give those seats to um, to our own, um, you know, to our own students who are coming out of high school. Give them scholarships. Give them um, uh, make room for them. Ease on the whole student loan thing, and you know, allowance and the pressure that comes with like the interest rates on student loans over the years. Has I remember, remember in the nineties, it was horrendous. You know, I would, I went and did a thirty thousand uh, dollar course and came out fifty thousand dollars because of interest. It was like interest, 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 and then you're like. I'm stuck paying this for the rest of my life. And, you know, what do you think about um, about the whole idea of where we, you know, we we kind of look strongly at immigration and say, look, okay, for the next six months, like America's doing, right? For the next six months, we won't allow um, workers from overseas to come and get jobs in New Zealand because we have 30,000 people out of un unemployed. So what if we do that for ourselves as well? Something for the short term to get our country back on, you know, money back on the table. I mean, in the hands, food on the table as much as possible. Because, I mean, summer's coming around. You know, we've got another few months and summer will be here. There'll be fruit picking jobs uh, and so much more, you know, um, summer jobs for the students and stuff. Do you think it's a good idea to maybe look at closing our borders in that area as well or no? You know, so this really goes back to, you know, the challenges around globalization and, you know, in reality, you know, we, we, we were sold um, a, an interesting deal. Mm. You know, I remember when any, um, you know, kind of imported goods, um, especially ele electronics and so forth, technology, were incredibly expensive in New Zealand. You know, look, in a way, you know, we, we, and I know this might sound a bit odd, but you know, there's a couple of there's a couple of interesting things happening here. the 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 first thing is that, uh, and 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 let's get back to kind of this question of like isolationist policies, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like, you know, there, there's a way of thinking about this of saying is that, you know, whilst we've all been individually locked down, you know, in place wherever we are, whether it be your car, your home, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I, I know people that have been, you know, doing it tough and, and found themselves uh, caught out. Um, but in a way, you know, you could all, you can extend that out from a national point of view and say, like, you know, each individual country is also kind of like, you know, in lockdown and then, you know, New yeah. Zealand becomes its own bubble. Yeah. Australia is, is its bubble. The US is its bubble. Um, you know, isn't it interesting in the EU, which is supposed to be, you know, a very open place, you know, all of those countries have, have gone back to becoming their own little bubbles again, you know. Yeah. And there's been it's, some... It's very interesting, you know, isn't it? Yeah, you know, there's been some saying that perhaps this could actually, you know, be the be the end of the European Union. I doubt it, but but it's certainly going to put it under strain. Yeah. Um. So here's here's the core problem that we've got, right? That two dollar shop, that two dollar t shirt that mm. you can go into a shop and buy for two dollars. It's got a hidden cost. Yeah. Right. It probably costs a hundred dollars. Right. It's just that the way that the world has been working is that we've deferred the other $98 that that T-shirt cost. Yeah. Now, the reason why it costs $2 is because in order to make it, it's being made um, with uh, extremely, it, it, on people on extreme low paid wages, yeah. Um, yeah. extremely bad working conditions, probably poor safety, uh, and um, the environmental cost of producing that T-shirt um, is a cost that that has been pushed out into the future, right? And so we've we've all been living in this fabricated, globalized society where somehow you can magically get a two-dollar T-shirt 
in, mm. in New Zealand landed after all of the cost of everyone's hands that it's had to go through, yeah. you know, to the port. Um, it's travelled, um, you know, probably from somewhere in Asia uh, on a ship, um, and there's all the costs of all the shipping. Uh, there's the factory where, you know, that T-shirt was made. Um, you know, these, these factories are not operating as charities, right? So they're making money somehow, making $2 yeah. T-shirts, right? But bear in mind, that's $2 in the shop, so the shop right. that you buy it from in Whangarei or Auckland, right? They're making a profit from it. Uh, the people that 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 you know um, uh, drove the truck that brought the t-shirt from yeah. Auckland to Whangarei, they're making a buck. Uh, the 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 ship that carried it from um, Asia into the port of yeah. Auckland, they're making a buck. So everyone's making a buck. Right out of this two dollar buck, yeah, yeah, and so you know, like there's something, there's something not quite right. Exactly, like, it's, it's something not quite right. So we've entered it, it ended up ended up in this this financial system that is just not quite right. And so you know, as a consequence of that, you know, we've ended up with this really skewed thing around. You know, not only is um, is our economy skewed that you can you can buy this two dollar t shirt which costs a lot more than two dollars, um, and that you know it, it's a debt that we've accrued. So so every time you buy a two dollar t shirt, uh, the the world is accruing a debt of ninety eight dollars, and at some point you know that debt's going to get called in, and, and we're facing it now. So you know there was a really interesting piece in the in the paper today about you know one of the opportunities that New Zealand has got. Is to and, and I, I want to call this kind of not so much a shift. It's like a it's like a tilt. We 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 need to tilt our economy away from the way that we used to think that we could be doing this. The world needs to tilt away from the way that we could think we could do this. You know, we we, we live on a finite planet. Mm. We don't have infinite resources. We live on a finite right. planet. And at some point, we were always going to face this situation of going, we cannot just endlessly perpetuate the economy um, based on magical fairy dust that yeah. will mean that everyone can do okay and that we can continue to make $2 T-shirts for everyone a day and everything yeah. will be fine, that we can we can move people between countries willy-nilly. Mm. And, um, and at some point, not have to face some cold hard realities like how do we deal with disease right how do we deal with um air pollution how do we deal deal with uncontaminated food supplies how do we deal with clean water resources um uh this is the opportunity for new zealand you know like if if if, if new zealand is really serious about what can we do next? Right. We, we need to build a way living beyond our means and living in a way which is e extracting um, from both the earth and from people, you know, because right. for you to have a $2 T-shirt, you know, somewhere in the world, someone has to get paid 10 cents, you know. Right. All whereas, whereas the person that's picking fruit, you know, gets whatever the hourly rate, you know, wage is for that. And um, so we've got these these huge disparities, these huge disparities. And 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 one one argument is to say, let's get the New Zealand economy back to normal. Yeah. The other side of it is that, well, there was nothing normal about a $2 T-shirt. Right. Um, and so, we, you know, I think New Zealand is... is, is is probably, you know, the unique position that New Zealand's going to find itself in is that we haven't uh, had tens of thousands of people die. We don't have right. a broken hospital system. Uh, we might have a lot of people unemployed. We might have a lot of businesses that are bust. Uh, but because we've not had the... Um, total kind of decimation that some of these countries have had mm -hmm. bear in mind that 
that that for every person that doesn't die, there's someone that is probably going to be really unhealthy for a very long time is going to be a, a, a an expense to their health care system potentially for the rest of their lives, right? right. Yeah. And so the unique position that New Zealand has is to say, given that we haven't been decimated mm. and that we're only dealing with a financial issue, really, uh, what are we going to do? And what's the smart thing that we can do? Um, and what's the opportunity that we have um, to basically re potentially rebuild our economy from the ground up? It is a good opportunity, though. I mean, like, I mean... Like a lot of fault, what I can see lies in the whole idea of open globalization, you know, where anybody could go in and out. Uh, we could take all the best uh, from like, it's, let's, let's look at sports, right? Mm. One thing I always hated was the All Blacks taking Pacific Island uh, players from the Pacific Islanders and putting them in the All Blacks. Now, if you look at that as how it happens on like, say, uh, nurses, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, technology. If ever, if all the Western countries did that, took all the people from a say less less richer countries, uh, less economically rich countries, uh, or you know socioeconomic um, lower socioeconomic, and we took all the best of those people, then what someone um, I've heard called the neo-colonization, neo right? The new, the new colonization, which is where we take the best of the world and we bring it into the Western world. And we leave those other countries without their resources of people, of quality people. And so I think this is going to put an end to, hopefully put a slight end to that where those quality people can stay in their countries and and like the whole idea of people being able to get 10 cents is horrendous anybody in their right mind will get it's, it's horrendous idea but at the end of the day it's a cheap t-shirt right that means I, I can pay less for that item so why won't i i would i could save say another ten dollars or so because i'm only paying two dollars for this but all these people that the Western countries have taken, and even they've come, some most of them have come for themselves, right? Because they want to help them. And this this is what immigration does: is where even myself, I'm here because my mom decided to, to it's a better life elsewhere than where we were in Fiji. So she made the movement way back in the 1980s. So I understand immigration in that capacity as well. Where hey, you know, let's go out and try to get a better life for ourselves because we get better work, better income, and so on. And you can get a better education and so on. But there's the other side where we just poach, right? We come over here, come over here, come over here. And then we go, well, we leave you without doctors. We leave you without nurses. We leave you without your best sports people. So whenever you go and play at the World Cup, your country loses and looks like idiots. But guess what? You're playing for us. And you make us look great. And that always made me not like the All Blacks, not like sports, because it was like, in the sense, it was like, why are you just doing that? Why don't you just build your own players up? There's enough players in your own country to get to that level. But instead, you want to pick and choose, you know, and this is the, the globalization of sports, you know, that whole multi-billion dollar industry of sports is the same way the doctors and nurses work around the world because of globalization. In the same way, technology, everything seems to do. And and I think this whole reliance upon that, this whole, it's put a hold on it. Pandemic has put a hold on that. We don't know if they're going to have, um, they might have the virus, right? So these, these you know, very high quality uh, uh, sports people, how do we know they don't have it? And so we'll be, you know, we'll get a chance to go, well, uh, excuse me, uh, might have to put you into lockdown for a while to make sure uh, we don't want to pay your cost of living while here. You know what we'll do? There's Bob over there. He's been trying to play in the All Blacks for a while. Hey, Bob, how about we give you fifty thousand dollars and giving this guy a hundred thousand dollars, and you just you know do a bit more, get up to your level. That's where I think we're going to be. At. And it's just, I mean, in my in my you know in my little mind, that's how I can I I can summarize that. It's like 
it is better to spend half the amount or a little bit more on our own selves than to go, hey, we'll take, uh, you know, Joe Blog over there. And it's the same thing when we do with, with our um, tourism, with our film industry, right? You know, how uh, basically they go, well, it's, you know, Americans will go, we'll shoot, we'll shoot the next uh, Tomb Raider in New Zealand because the American dollar, we get dollar fifty for one US dollar. And if we started thinking the same way as a country, I think we we could. But I mean, the whole idea of isolationism, people think oh, it's xenophobia and stuff. And I think they don't understand that sometimes that's not the word to use for it. It's the word to basically say it's it's actually not wrong to help yourself sometimes. You know, doctor, heal thyself, right? You can't heal anybody else unless you heal yourself. If you're bleeding there, uh, you know, if you uh, and and there's somebody else there needing help, you can't. By the time you get to them, you'll be dead yourself because you know you bleed you bled out. And I think we're in that situation now. We're bleeding out as a country, and we try and we think, well, we should help other people, help other people. But I think it's time to heal, heal our own wounds financially, uh, as well as mental health. I mean, mental health is a huge issue right now. I think. I mean, you as an artist, you understand that because um, I think. A lot of people, um, like, when we went into this, I was very concerned about the mental health of our country. I was really concerned because I knew that when, um, when especially on the art sector, not so much on most other people, and domestic was second on my, on my list, but really on the artists because I thought, you know what, this is going to really affect uh, very negatively on people who who ha aren't used to this, or who are already are uh, damaged, you know, uh, mental in the mental health. They're not used to. They're not used to working on themselves, and they're used to running for help every time they felt bad. I had that situation myself. Right when I moved into my apartment two years ago, I went to my sister and said, "Help me, help me, help me. I'm lonely. I'm lonely." She said, "Sort yourself out," you know, and I would be just as depressed now. If I didn't have that in me, if I what didn't have that information to say, if I hadn't sorted myself out, I'll be there freaking out. I'll be there going, uh, um, um, you know, just losing it mentally because I'm used to, you know, I've been in that place before, and I think it worried me when we went into lockdown. I was like, how? And so I jumped on on here every day for about a week and just said, hey guys, you know, weekly roundup, daily roundup, what you're doing, how's things, you know. Because I think, you know, as, as artists, we're so um, connected to the um, to our emotions, you know, and to our wairua, to the spirit, and to you know, and uh, we work out of a healthy mind. And if our mind is damaged, our mental health, because especially of loneliness and not being able to think, we can't cope. Our our work comes messy. And we become very depressed and inward thinking and we get down and down and like you said right at the start it's not your fault this whole situation we're in it's not our fault and um so i speak more on that from an artist's point of view you know like yeah sorry, yeah, sorry. you know we've, yeah, we've uh, I want to, um, um, let, let, let's, let, let's take the story kind of kind of been, kind of been recently. Been recently out. Out. So, so we've got um, sports people, we've got artists, um, and we've got people saying healthcare. Yeah. Um, hopefully, a lot of interesting questions are going to be raised around, you know, why is it that the sports person can earn the sort of salary that they yeah. do yeah and yet the predominantly nurses and school teachers uh, have been talking for a very long time about um, you know their challenges yeah with you know, and they're not just talking about challenges around 
you know, when, when I first kind of got to get more familiar with this, mm. in a country like Australia, where the disparity is is even pretty more pronounced, but you know, the, the school teacher or the nurse gets paid roughly what they get paid, no matter whether you're living in Auckland, yeah, uh, uh, Timaru, or mm. Wellington, or Christchurch, or Dunedin, right? Yeah. You get paid yeah. the same. But the cost of living, as far as, say, housing yeah. is an example, is wildly disparate, right? Mm. Now, and and then we've got our, our sports people, and, you yeah. know, I don't mean to, you know, not give gratitude or respect their art yeah. in what they do. But at this point in time in history, um, you know, our sports stars are basically on... Useless. On yeah, and they're, they're not needed. They're, yeah. they're, not, they're not relevant. Yeah, you know, just like, like celebrities. Well, you know, it depends on what you're a celebrity in. You know, like yeah. I, I've been enjoying as much as you've probably been enjoying, you know, various um, musicians, DJs. Yeah. Um, I've even I've even watched people uh, live streaming um, of artists painting, which yeah. has been amazing, actually, because um, artists who usually work in seclusion and, and work on their own yeah. and um, having, you know, conference video conference calls with lots of other artists and they're all kind of there you know like no, no one's probably being terribly productive but you know they're all having a go yeah um, so we have this kind of really interesting challenge of like what's your purpose right what what what, what what's your purpose and and what's your role and mm. i'm sure that uh you know, but this is a, a, an interesting time for us to kind of revisit this and to ask some really interesting questions of, you know, well, what, what, why does the the sports star get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not a million, uh, and yet the the nurse gets something that's just pretty barely above, you know, minimum yeah. wage, um, yeah. and artists typically, you know, get less than the minimum wage, and and it also yeah. You know, calls into question, you know, which is a topic for, you know, pretty a whole nother conversation of like, well, what is art? And, you know, yeah. But, you know, art is our, art is our imagination. Our art is our, is our, you know, what art asks the really interesting questions about who we are as humans. Yeah. It, it, it takes us beyond being just these creatures which just uh, you know because w without art w we could just employ robots mm. to do all mm. the to mm. do all these other tasks drones uh, uh, yeah drones you know so i don't think there's any real clear cut way but just around mental health you know uh uh, uh a very good friend of ours works with Lifeline. Yeah. And to the degree, obviously, you know, they've, they, they've got to work on basis of confidentiality and, and so forth. But, you know, there's definitely been an increase in the calls. And obviously, yeah. they're seeing a, a shift in the types of calls they're getting. I think what's really interesting is that, and not to oversimplify it, but, you know, mental health is very broad spectrum of things but obviously there are people that have mental health challenges um, that are things beyond um, you know just uh, mindset you know there are people that have got medical conditions there are um, genetic aspects there are uh, trauma situations that people have found themselves in and 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 so those types of mental health challenges seem to be sort of fairly consistent and obviously in times like these they can be you know exasperated the really interesting space is um that there's a whole bunch of people and a very large number of people across probably most countries that have got mental health um challenges because we don't live in a normal world and the reason mm. why we have mental health issues is because people are dealing with issues of 
poverty, yeah. of uh, not being able to get work, mm. of not being able to have work that's satisfying and that nourishes right. the soul, um, uh, uh, having, um, you know, financial difficulties that are either through their own fault or just through circumstances, people finding themselves living in, in, in living situations and housing, which is really difficult. And, and I actually think, you know, our biggest challenge is yet to come um, mm. as we move into the colder months. Yeah. Uh, the challenges will probably get greater of um, uh, the colder weather, being at home, having challenges around how do you afford to heat your home, the fact that there's probably, you know, in, you know, people living in situations where the mildew is dripping from the ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, but... You know, what are we going to do, you know, if we if we focus just on saying, right, let's just get New Zealand in good shape and let's make sure that we're okay. Mm. Well, that's 4 million people out of almost 8 billion people. It's a, yeah. it's a you know, like the population of New Zealand is a drop in the bucket. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're constrained by both the amazing largeness of our country and yet it's you know closeness mm. and then as we look out onto the the world outside of us um over the coming time you know we're already seeing countries in huge levels of need and it starts yeah. to like almost boggle the mind of saying is that e even if we got ourselves right at some points we get, at some point we're gonna have to look outside new zealand and yeah. go like how yep. can we help everybody else? But you know, even for a little country like New Zealand, what 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 is what is it that we can do that can help? Um, you know, like we're, we're talking about countries that have got average city sizes that are bigger than our population. Yeah, um, that are going to probably end up being decimated. You know, so. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're facing into this beautiful time of very big questions. Mm. Um, and I, I think we, we should, at, at the very least, just take a step back. Yeah. Take some breaths of hopefully non-contaminated air. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and, and think about, you know, you know, the tilt I think we need to make is that, you know, even before this global pandemic, mm. we, we were staring down the barrel and, and we're going to encounter this um, as we get into. Uh, so, so in a way, the really thing I'm fascinated about, totally fascinated about is what is the northern hemisphere going? Their, what is their summer going to look like? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to tell us some very, very interesting things around climate change, around the climate debate. Uh, and potentially, you know, uh, we, we face this challenge of we've, we've got this global pandemic at the moment. Mm. And, then, and then we've layered on top of that the financial challenges. What, what, what happens if you start to layer on other extreme weather events? What happens if all of a sudden, you know, there's some other natural disaster? Um, what if well, we somehow thought, we another saw. virus breaks out? Mm. Um, uh, we, we've been spending so much time living in a way of almost kind of ignoring um, the perils in the general world. And, and we might need to start to tilt to say, maybe we need to radically change the way that we're living uh, yep. so that we might actually contribute to survival because because living is a luxury and and survival might need to be the thing that we need to tilt our our, our mindset and our energy right. around and if we can do that in new zealand in isolation and if we can do it successfully maybe we've got something that we could actually export that sort of genuine value hmm. i mean we just said like in um the other week at fiji there was a cyclone and the Yasawas and um, 
And so right in the Ooh, middle of pandemic. Thing, yeah. So um and uh, and the Pacific Islands been hit you know, some of the islands, uh, I think Rotonga's um, close off their borders really quickly because they couldn't afford to have any case at all. You do not even one case will decimate the entire island. Mm. And that was uh, Fiji. One of my uh, family relations is actually in isolation in Fiji. Got it through the airport. One of my other um, uh, male, the other one in Fiji is female. The male one got it here at the grammar uh, school. You know, the Marist uh, gathering. So he's in isolation for the last few weeks. So, mm. you know, and then one of my friend's fathers died from coronavirus in America. So I'm looking at all of this and I'm thinking, you know, keeping an eye and, eye and finger on things. And um, and you're right, you know, we, we do need to help the other people. But I think if we come out of this, um, this curve or whatever they call it, we can then send our nurses and our doctors to say, the Pacific Islands, you know, our neighbors, and help them and maybe, uh, you know, ex uh, because our, our doctors and nurses would have been, would have learned really strong, you know, upskilled themselves really quickly with what's happened in New Zealand. Now you have very highly qualified doctors through this experience. We can send over to Fiji or the um, Samoa or uh, Tonga, you know, um, Yasawas uh, to help them because I know Guam been, Guam's been hit really hard and it's, you know, because then we can, like, if we're able to fix our wounds, we're able to then export our health, health elsewhere, um, you know, doctors and medical. And I think we have the best, um, you know, but uh, health professionals in the world, you know, one of the best, if not the, you know, I mean, everybody says that about themselves, but we know we, we're very highly qualified doctors because, you know, we spend a lot of time on them. And the, and you're right about the whole idea. And we've been discussing this idea of why are we paying rugby players more than we're paying doc, uh, our doctors and nurses and our, uh, uh, you know, our regular uh, high school and uh, primary school and teachers. Like the idea we're talking about university things, they can get hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for teaching 20 students, right? And uh, whereas our, you know, our everyday high school people, um, probably getting about half that amount teaching 100 to 50 to, you know, 60 a year um, students every week, you know, and um, when you got classes at university, there's only probably about five people by the time you get like my class, right? We started with something like about 20 people. Second year was like 15. Third year like was about eight, right? And so you think of all the people that didn't get into those, um, that didn't get into those positions, but, those uni professors are getting paid anyway, no matter how many people sitting on bums on seats. But we do need to spend, and I, I don't really understand why we don't, um, as a uh, as a country, spend more on our on our nurses, uh, pay their better wages, um, pay our um, our teachers better wages. I mean, parents, right? Parents at this month of being uh, having to homeschool their kids should finally realize what it would be like for 20 kids in their friggin home if you cannot I, understand i have no doubt that there's going to be so many more parents that are going to come out of um this lockdown uh level four and level three with uh, uh like a, a a much deeper appreciation of um what teachers do um, just to pick up on your your point there like you know if we're you know the the fact that you have multi-million dollar um uh salary sports professionals mm. is is kind of like the 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 inverse reason why we have people that that are that are living on like 10 cents a day somewhere else right. in the world like that's exactly. the you know, and uh, if we're going to tilt um, our um, economy towards survival, uh, then we're going to have to make some really tough choices. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we have to say, um, is 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 the money that that that's being directed at sport? the the right thing for now like that, that this is not 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 to say 
that sport's not important. It's like saying, you know, art is also important. But maybe we need to tilt towards saying, what's the right thing for now? I think as far as exporting, you know, we need to find a way to move away from this being money-based. Yeah. Uh, and, and we need to find a way that if we want to share with our Pacific neighbours mm. the um, the value and the benefits, and, and, and I think, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps this is the, the, the tilt that we need to make as far as if we're going to focus on New Zealand and then look outside, uh, maybe initially what we need to do is is to is to go back to our Pacific neighbours and and to look at you know what are the the, the things that they need um, that we can share mm. uh, and there's probably lots of different timescales around this so uh, you know certainly you know there's there, there's you know if if this pandemic came as a surprise to anyone well i'm 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 sorry that you were surprised mm. like you know pandemics have have been a high global risk for a long long time and we were actually um long overdue for something like this to to happen so um you know this should never have been a surprise but yeah. but but so many other things have been important. You know, uh, sad things happen in lockdown. Yeah. We, um, we um, and, and, and for, you know, well-off people like us, you know, um, when flicking through Netflix, looking at what's the next most interesting thing to watch, mm -hmm. ironically, the thing that we actually went back to was The Prince of Bel-Air with uh, Will Smith. Yeah. Um, if anyone has got access to Netflix, um, even if it's not your account, just push the person and watch, re-watch re the, the, the Prince of Bel-Air because it's actually incredibly prophetic and it shows kind of the demise of our civilization um, and it actually charts the demise of our civilization of, of, of valuing a whole bunch of things which are unimportant to our survival as a species and diminishing the value of um, other aspects. And we, we, we need to get things back in harmony again. You know, we, we, we need to have sports. We need sports. You know, yeah. I used to be a big sports fan. I'm not so much right now. Um, and also arts. I love the arts. You know, we need arts we need storytellers we need films we need movies we need we need comic books um we need doctors we need nurses but everything got out of kilter right. and and so we 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 our medical system you know like i think the best thing we could do out of this in some respects and there's probably a a list of things maybe i should create a, a list of like the top 10 things that we should do out of this um and, and don't me even start it on collective memory, right? Because the, the, the biggest problem that we face out of this is that we forget about this in a year's That's time. That's true. Yeah. Right? In a couple of years, we won't the even bother about this. Happen, yeah. The best thing that could happen right now is that we, we have to be in lockdown for the next five years. Like that would actually be a really good thing because it would teach us a thing or two about what's really important yeah. in in you know, for us. Um, and I, I tell you, we, we would get really, really good at combating disease. We would get really good at um, PPE. Um, you know, like uh, New Zealand should get really good at saying, how can we make homemade PPE? You know, personal protective equipment. How can we, how can we um, homespun vaccines? And right. therefore, how can we then export to the more vulnerable countries that, that we've got relationships with? How can we export them the knowledge and the expertise? You know, um, why can't we, we, we try and educate as many people as possible throughout the Pacific Islands, yeah. um, through our amazing universities and educational facilities, um, and, and educate them on... Um, yeah, world-class medical care. 
um, world class medical technology development, um, um, how to use three D printers to make your own high high end medical equipment. Like you, you know, like I think we're 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 talking about the same things, but you know, the problem is is that we've we've come from a world that before COVID nineteen, mm. our priorities were all over the place, right? And somehow we thought that you know research and consumer behavior and building better Westfield shopping malls in Newmarket and Auckland yeah. is like yeah. the pinnacle of our civilization. No, right. apparently consume, consume, consume. Of our civilization apparently now turns out to be um, knowing how to make a vaccine seems to be qu uh, quite an important tech um, skill right now. Um, and uh, where's the vaccine? Where's the vaccine? Where is it? Yeah. All right. We can't do it. Why can't we do it? Because apparently building, um, you know, a, a shopping mall worth hundreds of millions of dollars is apparently much more, you know, valuable to human society than knowing yeah. how to make a vaccine. Or putting it, uh, or making new um, AI technology, right? That's more important. Or making a better app or making a better game, that's more important. Or even worse yet, m um, better sports science. You know, what is the... What is the most important steroid, non-steroid mix of things? Or even the other thing, what's our ancestry? What's our DNA? <laughs> Where do we yeah. come from? That's it. You know, you could just basically send away your piece of your blood and, you know, or whatever and get back to find out which region of the world your, you know, your lineage comes from. That became more important than being able to hit, you know, vaccine, like you said. And it's, 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 I mean, the greatest thing about this is learning how people, who can cope in isolation and who can't, and um, who, what, what percentage, this is like a petri dish, right? One of my friends from America, we were talking about it, and it was like, you know, just think of it with a tinfoil hat for a second and think of it like this what if what if this with a tinfoil hat what if this is a test for a bigger pandemic right it's a, it's a you know it's just a thought it's like one of those tinfoil conspiracy thoughts you have and you go you know people have and sometimes people go in crazy on top of it but just not just not try to think in the middle of it and you know what if it's just a test where we can now learn for ourselves how to survive What's the most important things? Who are the most important people in the world? Doctors and nurses. Uh, who are the um, second most uh, essentials? People who provide our foods right away. You know, um, access to medical care, uh, pharmacists. Next in the rain, uh, our transport system, getting making sure things work. Helicopters get the buildings and stuff and um, our shipping works. What's not needed? And you go, well, this, this, this. And um, I think that is the most important thing in this, that you can learn what is important. I mean, you know, uh, we saw at the start where people were just crazy and hoarding toilet paper and hoarding food. And I was like, even when I was, when we went into this a week before we entered lockdown, I said to everybody, I said, look, get this, this, this. Don't go nutty. Don't go crazy. Just get enough as you need, but make sure you'll need it for four weeks, right? You'll need it more than four weeks because uh, that's what I was being told by my friends overseas. Like they were saying, this works really fast. The virus is moving fast. It's it just moves too fast, Ari. You know, it just moves too fast. Just be aware of that. And I was okay, cool. So I said, okay, guys, be prepared for four weeks, right? I mean, minimum two weeks. Just make sure you get enough food for two weeks. If you're good about two weeks, cool. But then. You know, you had people fighting over toilet paper, food, and not only that, we see people like, um, you know, abusing essential workers, you know, nurses and uh, people uh, in the stores who are putting their life on the line by having to serve us. And just, you know, those are the sort of people that you want away from society. And you go, okay, so this is how this percentage, this is the amount of percentage of our society with the tinfoil hats. This is a percentage of people you know we'll have to keep an eye on, right? Make sure you got 
this you know this many amount of police just to keep eye on that and then you go oh these people are okay and then you go to the next level so domestic violence is this percentage of our country so okay so we have to work on that area and the next thing uh mental health all right so we have this many people that percentage wise you know cutting down the cake uh pie whatever and saying this is the amount of people we need to look after when it comes to mental health so it's kind of like and the other thing is like one of my um uh, neighbors because i live in an apartment downstairs the other day i was on live streaming and i went to close my curtain because it was noise an ambulance arrived turns out he has diabetes complications with this um um with this accident and so the ambulance was there and i was like um okay is everything all right everything's okay he's fine so that sort of thing so you know we sort of find out okay so there's those people we were talking about this earlier right the percentage of people i'm not sure if i was talking with you about it but uh about um yeah it was just before we we're talking about the uh, amount of people that like actually have um occurring um health needs um and then then you've got like um you know you sort of it is these four weeks have been for our country as a whole and government right as a whole has been a learning experience for in case something worse comes i think and you know like you said pandemics always happen throughout throughout the years you know a few thousand years we've been living uh, with the different pandemics we've had um, outbreaks uh even sars recently you know um but i think if we we tend to forget like you said we tend to you know leave the past in the past and not learn from it and i think it'll be good to learn from this because it'll be it'll be a better way to deal with the next one and um because i remember like new york right the health minister in new york came out in uh, early march and said we're prepared don't worry about it guys we're prepared she was on there uh i think it was state minister of health uh surrounded by people saying hey come out and celebrate it's uh it's chinese new year's celebration you know get out go watch a movie go do this it's all good early march when people were just going like dying in droves over in italy and you know and they were just out there doing it it's like we all prefer we have all the equipment we have all this and it was one of the biggest cities hit because they were so arrogant and proud that they wouldn't listen to advice that hey you know this is moving too fast you know you don't gather self isolate and anywhere that haven't self isolated we found that that's where they you know gone to and i think we when we come out of this i'm hoping that we behave the same way we behave for the last four weeks or the last three four weeks that we still put on our masks that we still you know have your sanitizer in our hand we still do the distance the six foot distance or so for three weeks or two weeks whatever that and we'll our cases will go down and again then we'll go to level two and then at the end of the year back to normal because i know that we can't like we can't do plunge this year because it, you know it just won't happen because the numbers just uh, won't be allowed and i'm okay with that but i'm thinking of like we're talking with hindu uh, last saturday sunday uh, so much money economically and also mental mentally right the mental emotional health of us of our um our um our northern area due to the lack of art and the interaction between people right because we now learn to do things new like uh you know like you're saying before that we seeing people do things on the internet um show you know showing off their art and stuff that that we haven't been able to get privy to because before they would just show it here it is here's my finished product but now we're able to see them doing it and stuff and we get a better you know understanding of it but i i really feel for um for the loss for the loss of the arts that we're going to lose for the next six months uh in the in the way of uh festivals uh the way of uh conventions the expos the uh mass gatherings or watching a play you know uh school plays and such and such uh it's going to be interesting to see how the school works now because we the other thing that we haven't even talked about is the pressure on teachers to um do social distancing in classrooms 
I mean, we're teaching, we're telling them to be doctors, right, and police officers, and friggin' teachers, and parents, right, and educators at the same time. We're telling them to do five different things, and we're putting them all on one person in a classroom full of about 20, 30 people. Yeah, well, you know, teachers and those working in child care and, and, and health professionals as well, you know, they... You know, that, like they're, they're putting um, uh, their own families at risk. Yeah. Um, I, well, my, my, uh, my, fam my family members had to send their children away because of that for an entire month, mm. right? So we can't have the kids at home. Uh, kids, uh, mum and dad are medical people. We don't want you affected. So uh, we're going to send you over to our rallies to stay. And... You know, so when I when I think about all these things, I've got a wider range of things shit happening in my life, and I'm thinking, you know, you get a better idea of think. Well, if this is happening in my life, how is it happening in other people's life? How they're dealing with it? You know? So yeah, carry on. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, um, you know, this is I think the thing that uh, all of us are getting an opportunity to kind of think more deeply about uh, is how how's how's everybody how's everybody else affected differently from yep. us uh and you know this is really challenging you know like uh people don't always get to think about other people and how they're impacted yep. uh and you know it was you know, it was very, um, it was very clear early on when things started happening in Italy as they did that uh, we really were dealing with a, a, a very challenging and, and serious um, disease. Uh, but you know, we, I think, the really important. Uh, thing to note at this point is along the lines of what we've been talking about we've been like we, we had the opportunity to start to get connected with what was happening here um, quite early on uh, mm. basically end of January because we um, uh, were hanging out with someone at a at a festival over summer, who mm. was a teacher um, in China, yeah. and uh, had basically taken leave. So uh, we've been kind of ac across. We, we were across it, and then watching it and seeing it develop. But maybe think about this. Think about everything that we've been through since the beginning of the year, since the first mm. of January. Think of that as like day one. Yeah. And what happens after? That's the rest of the training. Yep. Um, I'll be back in one moment. So we're having a really conversation, guys, about uh, about what's happening and how we get through it uh, on the other end. Because um, um, I've known Jared for about almost two years now, and he's he's been a great kind of like. Um, a mentor in the side of like uh, how to think about business and how to um, you know kind of associate uh, I guess in the way of finances and art and stuff and it's uh, it's always good to widen your um, your knowledge base with people and stuff so I, I tend to like um, you know surround myself with smarter people and it's it's and so that I can have you know learn more I'm always in the I um, business of learning um once you start stop learning you might as well stop thinking about things so joe will be back in a second and um we'll carry on with that thank you for joining us guys uh appreciate um you know hanging out on this on a deeper conversation um as we did last week uh aside from just talking about art and um you know entertainment and um the comic book industry and so on but talking about more about uh, economics, financial um, risk management, 
uh, with Tello. Welcome back, Jared. Yeah, Carry so, on. you know, like uh, a lot of people are going to think that next week in New Zealand when we um, go to level three, mm. that we're on the pathway um, towards things somehow going back to normal. Mm, mm. I think that's what's going to happen, and it's going to be a weird because it's not going to happen that way, you know? No, we, 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 we are basically, you know, leaving day one mm. and going into day two of a very, very long disaster. Yeah. And... Uh, probably what's, in some respects, a bit, uh, what's the word? I would say dysphoric, but uh, what, what's going to be really, really challenging is uh, it's going to be this feeling whereby, you know, when you wake up in the morning and, you know, perhaps notwithstanding what your personal situation is, but, you know, if you wake up in the morning and the sun is shining, the sun is shining. If you wake up in the morning and it looks rainy, you know, you're going to feel a little bit differently. And we all respond differently on sunny days and rainy days. But let's say just typically, if you wake up and the sun is shining, you go, oh, what a what a great day, you know, despite mm. my, my circumstance situation. You, you wake up and it's rainy and you feel oh, mm. a little bit tougher, you know, especially if it's cold and it's going to get cold. Uh, but things in New Zealand you know, on the whole, and once again, you know, this varies across individual to individual. But, you know, New Zealand is, on the whole, you know, going to be in a situation where by next week we, we are pretty much on top of COVID-19. Mm. The rest of the world is not. Yeah. And it won't be for a long time. And it's going to feel really weird when... Um, you know, the more we get back to operating similarly to what we did before, and yet the rest of the world isn't. But but you're gonna know you're gonna know it because there's gonna be lots and lots of different ways. Like, you know, even for example, um, at some point, uh, Netflix is gonna run out of content. Yeah. But as far as new content, right? Because all all their production stuff is is on hold, you know, like, you know, Net Netflix is, is making a fortune at the moment, but... Um, well, um, HBO Max is coming on the 28th of May. So maybe we can move into that. There's that possibility. If you want to drop your um, Netflix that's and move right, on that's to That's what's going to happen, isn't it? Is that, you know, yeah. people, are gonna, you know, it's kind of like, well, I've watched everything that I can possibly watch on Netflix. Okay, yeah. now I'm going to move to the next one and... You know, but at some point, you know, you'll you'll go around on this roundabout, and then it's kind yeah. of like, oh god, has anybody got anything new? You know, and 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 maybe you know, this is part of the intersection of like, you know, if we're talking about art mm. um, and content, uh, that uh, I think we're actually finding out, you know, a, a lot at the moment about art, creativity, and content. Uh, you know, it's amazing um, the sorts of things that people have, you know, kind of really f been finding um, enjoyment from. It. It's been incredibly amazing to see the um, amount of content that's actually been kind of, in effect, gifted. So uh, there's been, um, I know that the uh, there's been a lot of New Zealand um, cultural productions that have been put online for free that have either previously not been available or you had to pay for in some way. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, stage productions and musicals and in some cases even films and documentaries being released because there's no chance of any cinema release or any, you know, big grand, you know, release. So they've just gone, uh, you know, here it is. Um uh, for for people that are that are so inclined, the 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 latest one at the moment that I just would suggest that 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 people take a deep breath mm. and and watch and maybe watch 
earlier in the day. I don't, I don't think this is the sort of thing you want to watch at the end of the day because when you're going to be too tired, um, it's actually quite a, a mentally kind of intense thing to watch. Uh, but Planet of the Humans. If, if, if anyone has, has previously been into watching Planet of the Apes, then the, the new thing that you need to watch is Planet of the Humans by uh, Michael Moore. There we go. Yeah, add that to the uh, to the to the watch list. Have you had a chance to oh. watch that at all yet? No, I um I I've just stayed away from live action. I've been watching American mm. Dead. <laughs> all yeah, right, so uh, um, we've come up to the one hour forty minutes, like a whole movie length um, discussion. It's almost like well, a documentary. The, uh, the length of, uh, Planet of the Humans. So uh, yes. we're kind of like very close to, to replicating um, uh, the uh, the feature length Planet of the Humans. Mm. All right. So um, how about we finish up here and um, we'll, we'll discuss movies offline. Uh, but is there anything in closing you'd like to say? Um, um have hope, you know, have hope. Uh, I think New Zealand is very fortunate um, that, you know, hopefully regardless of your political persuasions and so forth, um, that, um, you know, you've got some confidence that you've got a, a, a government that is really going to try really, really hard. Um, and, and also, you know, we should always hold governments accountable yeah but also uh i think we we need to be really careful about the balance and harmony mm. between holding accountability and going you know like this is not a job that you would wish for anyone to <laughs> unpick yeah. to say uh, you know that a very you know complex 21st central globalized economy yeah now being in this situation um, uh, as a result of a virus that, that we can't see, that we know very little about at this point, um, that let, let's, have, let's have hope, let's put some faith in, in you know, your local community organisations. Um, yes, let's retreat back a little bit um, and, and look after you know, your own far now and, and, and really be part of your own local community and find out who your even your local community even is. Um, spend more time in it. Um, and I think the the other really important key message, particularly for young people, but everyone, New Zealand has elections coming up this year. If you are not registered for vote, you need to get registered, get informed about the questions that you're going to be asked at this election mm. um, because uh, no matter how well we've done to now yep. or even if you're critical, but if you are not registered to vote, there's nothing you can do about it and no amount of... Exactly. Um, no, no, no amount of you know complaining or no amount of, of thinking oh they should do this and they should do that like New Zealand has got such a wonderful electoral system it's got one of the best electoral systems in the world mm. be part of it understand the issues that are coming up um, and and you know we, we can we can the, the only way New Zealand is going to get out of this um, and it's going to, New Zealand's going to have to do a lot of this alone. Um, we're going to have to find some ways in New Zealand to heal some very, you know, deep wounds, some some very big differences in, in views of the world and opinions. Um, and I'm not I'm, I'm not going to do the kumbaya, you know, we all need to come together and hug and love, right? Because we can't do that. Yeah. That's dangerous, you know. You might get infected. Yeah. But 
we, we, we need to find a way to seriously bridge some long-standing wounds and harm and trauma and 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 find ways um, to 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 work th to work through this um, and and to to really cherish the way that New Zealand has got an opportunity to get through this in a way um, that we've managed to do yeah. almost the impossible already. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I was quite critical because at the start, because I want us to go into lockdown at least two weeks earlier because of what I was hearing from America. And, um, and um, I was concerned about the Pacific. I was really concerned mm -hmm. about the Pacific. It was my first thing, it was like, we, you know, we need to stretch, closed up straight away and then I was you know one weekend I was like why didn't we close in earlier right and then I was like okay it's pointless to argue about that now let's move on to how do we you know how do we make sure that we manage the health and mental health of the community and so on I was like okay that aside <laughs> you know and you're right I'd forgotten about the elections and you know a lot of times people like to sit on the side and complain and not be part of the um, part of the game, you know. And um, politics is like is a game, you know. It's like two sides playing sports, and you gotta have, you know, you gotta support your player. Otherwise, you know, you can't sit on the on the on the friggin' um, mm. you know, on, on the on the benches looking and then complaining because, you know, you know, you gotta find the person who's, you know, views are similar to yours or what hold. But of course, we. You're right. Our our MMP system is really amazing, and it's and uh, compared to like, I mean, you look at America. There's only two parties always at war with each other, right? Whereas in New Zealand, we're able to have so many different things. We can go after one one member from one party. They can be part of the whole, you know, membership of you know running a government from a different party. So. It's, yeah, it is quite unique, and I think we have an amazing chance. But I think it's going to be surprising to see, uh, I mean, we don't have a strong opposition, which is really what annoys me, you know. Um, but I wish there was, you know, just so that there is a counter to what is going on. Whereas it's like most of the time all you see is complaining, 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 but not any direct um, ideas coming forward, you know. I mean, it's like you look at the health minister, right? You know, the health minister, <laughs> goes and does his own thing even though he's advising everybody not to and that sort of thing that's not this person sort of person you want to be having in government they tried that in fiji as well and um and fiji was one rule for everyone so you know it was like if you are a if you're being paid by the taxpayer you're a citizen and you get treated like a citizen if that if a citizen breaks a law he goes to jail or goes to court that happens to you doesn't matter if you're a prime minister or a minister and we saw, I think, seeing Jacinda not deal with them straight away, that kind of made people think bad leadership. Because I would have been there going, uh, lost a job, go at home, forget about this, next person. That would have been like clear cut. And I think a lot of times people have, uh, though, I think, I mean, I, I understand, you know, because I'm, 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 I like to listen to various news and um, get, you know, what's going on around the world. The mixed messages really muddle things up in the mm. early stages. And later on, later on, in the, like week two in, we understood that, hey, this could be long term. Okay, this is how you behave. Let's work together. But the first two weeks, there was like too much floundering. But then to have the health minister come in and do that, then have Honey Harawira travel from Auckland to Kaitaia, it was like, you are our leaders and you're not leading by example. Mm. And you're right, the elections are coming up and we get to choose who we, you know, who we think would be better to manage or whether Jacinda stays in or we get rid of her other people and she mm. leads with somebody else. So this is a great thing about um, MMP, I think. You get to pick and choose who governs us rather than the one person with their entire, you know, yeah. um, entire group.
of, and, of and, and just on that, you know, and like I say this very deliberately and carefully because I have um, no, I don't want to sway people around, mm. you know, what political choices they want to make. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, but what's really important is to you, you, you don't get to vote unless you register. And I think we yeah. need to have a big, big push on ensuring that as many people as possible, particularly young people yeah. and those that are kind of, you know, not comfortable with it, um, interfacing with the system, like it's very easy to to register. Yeah, it's very easy to register to vote if if you know the system. Yeah. But for many people, that's a very daunting thing. For young people, they just gotta go. Oh well, you know, what does that really matter? Yeah. Now, once you then register to vote, then the other big challenge that we face is that you know this is not a conspiracy theory. Mm. is that you will be manipulated. You will be manipulated yeah. about choices, yeah. about who to vote for. Um, and so we need people to um, register to vote. We need them to then go out and vote because it's no use yeah. then being registered and then not voting. Yeah. And then in the in, in between period from when you register to vote and do it on time, and then when you get a chance to vote in September, which you will, in the intervening period, be super, super careful about the information that you're consuming because, um, and I really encourage people to, um, uh, you know, watch YouTube, watch, watch people like Edward Snowden, who um, were people that revealed the level of, um, access to your personal data, the level to which that it, it's being manipulated, and just make really, really sure that you're really, you know, in your heart that you're really comfortable with um, the information that you're receiving and, and, and make the best choices that you can. Um, and, that, and that's kind of like, I think that's the next big call. Like, so we've had the big call so far for New Zealanders to to stay at home. We had a we had a big call for people to do whatever they could, you know, to show respect and to celebrate Anzac Day in, in lockdown. And I think the next thing that we need to do, um, aside from obviously carefully, carefully respecting the recommendations around next levels of, of you know, going from level four to level three, we might go back up to level four for a little bit. We might then go back down to level two. But whatever you do, like, you know, do do the right thing, you know, with within what you really feel is the right thing to do in your heart mm. and really love and feel the community that's being created. Yeah. And uh, we, we've got an amazing opportunity because... If we if we don't if we don't see, you know, um, and and, and let, let whilst we're here, right? Let let's take it to the magic two hour, and then yep. let's. Okay, so one of the other interesting things, if you look at the data, we've been seeing data about how different countries have been responding to COVID nineteen. You know, one interesting slice is that some it, it appears that some countries that have been most successful. Um, you know, either took early measures or yep. they've people have looked at it from the dimension of, you know, the, the politics of the country or they've looked at, um, you know, one interesting thing is that lots of the countries that are doing really well around um, getting on top of COVID-19 just happen to have um, female leaders um, or strong, strong, and and I don't think it's about the feminine. It's it's or female leaders per se. It's about it's about countries that have got a more of a tilt towards um, more care for the health and well-being of their populations versus 
uh, profit because a lot of the protests that are happening at the moment, and, and, and these are this is incredibly disturbing, the amount of protests that are anti-lockdown, you know, like, wow, like, it's really interesting. Um, and, and we'll see how that happens, right? Hey, yeah. you know, the first time, right, we don't get to, we, we don't have to debate in social media whether mm. it's right for someone to protest or not. We're going to see now within two weeks the uptick. Well, I, I think a, a lot of the protest is coming out from people, like we're talking earlier on, not having money. Uh, and, uh, and, and we know that when, when, when there is no food on the table, there's revolution. And it's always happened. Uh, kings have been deposed. Revolts have happened. Crowns have been lost because of no food on the table. When the people starve, people, the anger from um, the hunger pains leads to anger at the people in power. And so I don't, I, I don't think uh, the protest is there in that sense of that. And I also understand that media likes to make a big deal about everything. Like you're talking about manipulation, and uh, and so I'm, you know, that's the great thing about. Um, about having social media and like YouTube and stuff, you're talking about Snowden, we knew what had happened there. It was open to everybody to see for themselves. And like uh, I spend most of my days listening to different uh, commentators and stuff and different news, uh, rather than the one that, they, you know, like you get your own little clip on the news, say like, uh, say if you're watching um, TV and Z, you're only getting from one news source from America and because they pay into that broadcasting system. Right, because that's how they get it. So it's like, oh, we can we can only get from Warner Media content, or you can go to TVNZ. You can get only from NBC network. But then you've got all these other, um, you know, lower tier networks who do independent um, thing that we never see. And so I'm, you know, I'm able to, I like to see all of that. And um, the other thing is that the greatness of social media is you get to see how politicians behave mm. going into election. We've seen how they behave now. We're talking about the health minister doing his craziness, right? Breaking mm. the law as a leader, as a health minister of the, you know, for New Zealand, you know, and you go, ah, oh, well, if someone like him doesn't have integrity or principles, then we got to make sure doesn't matter what who we choose that we feel that they have integrity and principles, and that's what it comes down well, to. Well, you touched on that, right? And you know, like I don't want to kind of you know sure. down play what you did, right? But you know, also you know, we all fuck up. You know, like <laughs> of course, um, you know, like the, this is the first major global pandemic in you know over a hundred years, and um, yeah. you know, I th I think we should also you know um, learn to cut oh. and slack. But, you know, of it's course. kind of like, how much slack do you cut, right? Exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I, I think we've learned so much. Yep. We've learned so much. And, um, you know, but now is the right time to, for us to be asking questions about where, where, where do we go from here? And I think, you know, you're, you're doing this is amazing because um, we need to really, I think, encourage people to be not 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 protesting and 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 yep. not resisting, you know, the inconveniences. Um, we, we 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 need to address the fundamental kind of things, like you say, right? Mm. Um, you know, m m most of the protests that I've been seeing at the, at the moment. Um, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I think mm. that there are, like I said before, the real problem that we're dealing with here mm. is not COVID-19, but it was that we came into COVID-19 with a world that was breaking apart yeah. and that had very deep, deep, challenging issues. Um, even if we survive COVID-19, um, we are facing into um, 
the worst climate change impact on human civilization yeah. um, that we've faced in, in, in an extremely long period of time. And um, like you said, I, I think you're entirely right. We are, this is a training ground, not, 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 not for COVID-19. This is a training ground for saying, how are we going to deal with all these other things? Because we cannot, we cannot go into the next disaster being so underprepared. Yeah. We are, we are looking at a human society that is, underprepared yeah thank All you right, so that's that's a two hour mark uh thank you jared you did it perfectly you got us to the two hour and um excellent so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop here and i'm going to carry on with again and um